36.5% of the people in this riding didn't vote in the last election. Shame! 60% of those people were young people under the age of 30. We need people out voting. You'll know, you've seen me at, at FIPA rallies opposing the Foreign Investment Promotion and Protection Agreement along with the Council of Canadians and LEAD NOW, opposing CETA, the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement with European Union, you know, trade agreements with investor state in them that allows corporations to sue governments for laws and policies that they don't like. You know, when we tell them that we want to protect our environment, that we want good labor standards, that we want health and safety standards, we want good consumer standards, those trade agreements with investor state allow corporations to sue us, and I've been out at every one of those Lead Now rallies organizing them here. <laughs> and organizing our Defend Our Coast, Defend Our Climate rallies. But this one here, I waited. I waited to see if somebody else was going to hop in, and I know my, my friends in the Council of Canadians, uh, some of the organizers are really busy today with Vancouver Island Water Watch, working on Step two of protecting our, our watershed and watersheds on Vancouver Island. We did a presentation to City Council on Monday about our watershed. It's owned by private interests, logging companies, and we think it should be public like the Victoria one. And they're busy working on a meeting today. So I waited to see if somebody was going to take this on because I am a partisan now. I'm the Green Party candidate for Nanaimo Lady Smith. <laughs> But I believe that political mo movements and social movements are deeply intertwined and I'm not giving up on social movements to be a politician. Yeah. Hey. So, I have invited all the other candidates to speak today in, in, in fairness. And so Sheila Malcolmson is here to speak today for the NDP. Uh, Mark McDonald is busy. Doing something else. I, I, I wanted him to come and take his five minutes to explain, you know, why it is he might support this or if he has the guts to speak against uh, his uh, leader, Stephen Harper, to say that this is wrong. He doesn't dare. No, he didn't. He couldn't make it. The Liberals don't have a candidate yet and they, they sent me an email saying that, that I, you know that 80% of the population supports this bill, don't you? <laughs> Yeah, that's, I know, that's ridiculous, isn't it? I'm, I was so happy to see, you know, when this bill came down, January 31st, Elizabeth May was the first one to get up in Parliament on February 2nd and speak out against it. There's been lawyers pouring over this thing for weeks and they're still finding interpretations about this vague piece of legislation that will criminalize, criminalize all kinds of actions that we do to perfect our environment, to protect labor standards. This will criminal, criminalize wildcat strikes. It could criminalize the behavior of, of uh, airline stewardesses or walk off the job. Criminalize any kind of behavior that, that is deemed to be in the national interest uh, that opposes the government. They're the ones that decide what's going to be criminal and what's not. It's seriously flawed. So I'm going to invite Marjorie Stewart up to say a few words and talk a little bit about this and then we're going to get Sheila to come up and talk about the NDP position. The Liberals uh, couldn't make it. They said there'd be a few Liberals here in the crowd. They are going to vote for this bill. They're hoping they're going to change it once they get into power, but that's okay. not the way to do things. Right. Right. If you're in opposition, if you have a problem with a piece of legislation, you don't get up in Parliament and talk about what's wrong with it and then vote for it. Right. Exactly. You vote against it. If it's a flawed piece of legislation, you vote against it. Right. So here's Marjorie. Right. Things I don't like about Bill C-51. Number one, it was bad enough when the RCMP did both spying and enforcement. It was bad enough when CSIS was invented to spy on all of us, but now they're given the power to enforce too, and that's a bad combination. Second thing I don't like about C-51 is that people can be detained on suspicion, lowered the burden of proof, no evidence, suspicion only. If they go to trial, part of the trial may be held in secret without even their lawyer, or let alone the accused present to hear what's being said, and the judge may make a decision based on what was said in secret. 
It's a disgusting bill. I'm with Clayton Ruby, leading Canadian lawyer, who says this bill cannot be repaired. It has to go. So, I'm an elephant's child. The elephant's child always wants to know why. Why? Why are they doing this? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Our leaders are invested in the dominant culture, the culture of domination, and they're frightened. And they're not quite sure whether they're more frightened of these new, crazy, homegrown people who call themselves jihadis. And let's note that they've only managed to kill two people in the last period that they've been driving this, this, this crazy notion that the Harper government has picked up on or whether they're more afraid of us. So we get this bill, which is kind of a scattergun approach. And when people are afraid, and they have the ch chance, they move to totalitarian ways. And if you've forgotten what totalitarian means, it means absolute rule from the top down. And that's what Stephen Harper does when he's afraid. And he's afraid of us. There's a, there's a very interesting tool of totalitarianism in play too, and I call it misdirection. It's like an illusionist who performs illusions and things that you know can't be happening are in front of you and what is happening isn't noticed. And I think what they want us to do is to stop paying attention to the real problems in the world to which governments like Stephen Harper's government uh, contribute, for instance climate, energy, banking corruption, supporting the First Nations resurgence, population excess, and a few homegrown terrorists. Between 1995 and 2015, 1,182 Aboriginal women were killed or disappeared. In that same time period, two were killed by so-called jihadis. Are we afraid? We are involved in what appears to be a major class war, the 1% against the rest of us. And more tools of totalitarianism are brought into, into play. Fear, scapegoating, militaristic violence, and it'll come from our kids in the army and in the police force. Never forget that police forces were invented to protect the property of the warrior class. I want to do what's now called a, a shout out to our allies, to the Occupy movement, which gave us the 1%, 99% metaphor. Brilliant. They have identified the class war that the illusionist in Ottawa didn't want us to notice. I want to do a shout out to Idle No More against all odds and a culture of repression and contempt. They have created a renaissance amongst our Aboriginal people and I think the women had a lot to do with it. I've already told you about the subversive nature of growing your own food. Uh, and I could go through a list. With, we all know what the list is of things we need to do to keep ourselves under the radar and safe from the likes of the illusionist in, in Ottawa. So I just wanted to say one quick word about resistance. We are the resistance. We resist in every way we can, where we can, what we can, when we can. Resistance is not futile. Thank you. Bravo. All right, thank you, Marjorie. Well, when Elizabeth May read this bill, she just had a quick scan of it. She didn't need to get lawyers plowing through to see something wrong. She picked off a couple of clear phrases and she realized that she said this, you know that this bill has provisions in it that if Rosa Parks lived under this legislation, when she got on the back of the bus down south and defied those laws about segregation, 
she would be covered by this anti-terrorism act and she would be a, a terrorist. Yeah, the front of the bus. Got from that from the back to the front. And when anybody that supported her would be a terrorist under this legislation. And any journalist that reported on what she did would be a terrorist under this legislation because this legislation covers speech as well. Freedom of speech. And so this is a serious piece of legislation. There's a, like I said, there's a lot of depth to it, but there's some really obvious things in it. So after Elizabeth got up, she was ridiculed. But she has since had four former prime ministers stand up and say this is wrong. <laughs> She's had five Supreme Court justices say that this is wrong. She's had the Privacy Commissioner say that this is wrong. She's had hundreds of professors, the legal community, in the, in the legal minds, uh, constitutional experts, line up, write this letter, long letter that's got hundreds of signatures on it saying that this bill is flawed and they line up all the reasons why it is. She's got standing with her the editorial boards of the Globe and Mail, the National Post, the Toronto Star. You know who else is on our side? Conrad Black. Rex Murphy. Rex Murphy tore this thing apart. And Christy Clark. Christy Clark says this is wrong. We know that this bill is so flawed. And I was so happy to see that the NDP, it took 17 days, but they got on board and they are opposing this bill. So I'd like to welcome Sheila Malcolmson from the NDP candidate from Nanaimo Ladysmith up to say a few words about it. Thank you. So we recognize that public safety is a high top priority for a responsible government. No question on that. And is if the Harper government really believed that, then they would be acting very differently in all the other legislation that they are bringing into Parliament. They would be standing up to protect Indigenous women and women at risk from violence and murder. <laughs> and they are not. They would be standing up and prosecuting uh, em uh, corporate employees that endanger their workers' safety and their life, and they are not prosecuting and not protecting workers' safety. And the Harper government, if it truly believed in public safety, would be legislating climate change and mission reductions, would be protecting our coast from the danger of intensified storms, other parts of the country from drought, uh, the, the, uh, the true undermining of our environment and economy by failing to act on that most enormous public safety issue, climate change, and they are not. Right. And right in our own neighborhood, they would not be undercutting science, the Coast Guard, oil spill prevention offices. If they truly wanted to protect us from threats in our community where we would live, they would not be undermining environmental protection uh, safety net. They would not be undermining public employees that are carrying that work out. So when we have a government that is failing to do these most basic, basic functions of what a responsible government should do, we come out like this in the sunshine and in the rain and the snow, and we come together and we protest, thank goodness. And to imagine that we've got legislation that is going to uh, prevent, interfere, or even just intimidate people from taking that most basic function as citizens to say no more wildcat strikes, to say no more uh, protests without a city hall permit, to say no more uh, indigenous people standing up against pipelines and environmentalists and voters everywhere standing up in solidarity with them. It's shameful and it's wrong. <laughs> So 
know we Democrats are going to try to interfere with this legislation in every way we can. Standing up in the House, standing up in committee, yes. And this is one of these partnerships. You've got people inside the system using every legal mechanism that we, we can. We've got people in the street keeping the pressure on, keeping the a focus on how wrong this is. It's a vital partnership. I'm so glad we're working together. Yay! And we're in great company. We've got uh, former prime ministers we never thought we would ever agree with. We've got uh, the Assembly of First Nations so thankful to them for initiating the first constitutional challenge of this legislation, standing up so strongly. Assembly of First Nations leadership, thank you. And we're going to keep the pressure on as voters. We're probably not going to be able to turn this around within this cycle. We've got a federal election coming up very soon. We're going to keep focusing on uh, not allowing fear to intimidate us. We're going to keep celebrating the work that is happening in our communities to truly make us safer, stronger places to live. So I want to just give such a big thank you to the organizations and citizens that are working against the true threats to our community. Poverty, racism, um, uh, uh, ecology, people that are working hard to feed our communities, people who are trying to build that renewable, resilient, sustainable society and economy that we are all working together in our way. Thank you to those organizations to, and not allowing this uh, Harper interference to interfere with that vital community work. We need it so badly. Thank you. Do you have an opinion? If you want to register it, go to nowpolling.ca right now and you can register whatever kind of opinion you would like. And if you don't see it, you can scroll to the bottom of the page and you can put your own question down and poll yourself. Yay! What a good idea. Monday, you are uh, you're running for the Green Party, and uh, what is the difference between the Green Party and uh, and the NDP at this time? There's a bunch of different differences between the Greens and the NDP. The Green Party is the only party that opposes every bitumen pipeline, every new pipeline coming out of uh, the tar sands, and we oppose them for the. A uh, few reasons. One, we don't want to be exporting raw bitumen. We don't want run, running to be running raw bitumen out of pipelines. Mm -hmm. The tar sands are expanding fast enough at just under two million barrels a day, mm -hmm. and we don't need to expand the tar sands any further because of the, the issue of climate. We don't want to expand the tar sands further because of that. So we're the only party that's opposed to uh, tar uh, any new pipelines coming out of the tar sands. Mm -hmm. We're the only party that opposes every. Uh, free trade agreement that has investor state clauses in it and we have a record of voting against every one of those in Parliament and the other three parties have voted for the Korea, Korea free trade agreement with Canada mm -hmm. and the Panama free trade agreement with, pa uh, with uh, Canada and both of those agreements have investor state clauses that allow corporations to sue governments for laws and policies that infringe on their profitability. The how, how about the, the free trade with Europe? Uh, where are you standing there? Well, we're opposed to the free trade agreement with Europe because, again, it has investor state policy in it, investor state provisions. And we don't need investor state provisions in an agreement with Europe. They have a good judicial system. Canada has a good judicial system. So we don't need private, secret tribunals making decisions about trade uh, disputes between you know countries in Europe and countries in Canada. We should be able to do that through our court system. Do you think that most people would be opposed to that, or is it just the parties? Um, most people, when they understand what investor state is about and how it's used uh, to um, affect public policy and how it's used, you know, that Canada has $2.5 billion worth of lawsuits against it right now under NAFTA, when people understand that, 
they oppose it. It doesn't make any sense to allow corporations to sue for environmental policies that they don't like, for the loss of potential profit. And how can you be sure that most people oppose it? Do you have any uh, referendum, any plebiscite, any polls that uh, they assure you that most people oppose it? On investor state? No, there's been no there's been no okay. polls on investor state that I know of. I think like the, when people people understand the issue, anytime you explain it to to people, yeah. they go that that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And I, I think that you know we we need to educate people about what investor state means, and we haven't had a, a you know a serious discussion about it in Canada. The Council of Canadians has been pushing this agenda. The ju the Trade Justice Network has been pushing this issue for how many years? For years and years and years, going so, back to going back to, to, to NAFTA. But so you think that people would by now understand what that problem with uh, free trade agreements is, and therefore all you need is a poll to prove that uh, the majority of Canadians are on your side. Yeah, you need you need to educate people through the media, and if the media is not talking about it, then how are people how are people being reached? Are you afraid that people are not educated so far? Well, not a, about investor state, and I think what's what we're seeing in Europe right now is that. They've, they've uh, signed this agreement on CETA, but the same agreement is coming through in the Transatlantic Trade and Investment uh, Partnership with the United States. And as soon as the, Ameri the Europeans figured out that American corporations were going to be able to sue, then they started to oppose it. And then Canadians, Council of Canadians, has been saying, well, this is in CETA. Mm -hmm. And so now uh, the, the German Parliament and the French Parliament are both saying, this is a bad idea. So now they're opposing CETA, investor state and CETA in Europe. And the more people that understand what it's about, the more likely we are to have a backlash against it in Canada. It, you know, like polling on an issue is complex. You know, like trade and trade agreements and investor state, it's a complex thing to explain to people. So you, you are afraid that people might not understand and vote against uh, their own interest? Yeah, I think, I think people don't understand the issue. Most people don't know that it's going on. So it's difficult to represent people that don't understand what is going on. Yeah, you need to, you need to educate people, and that's part of the whole yeah. process of, of politics and engagement and, and being able to talk to people about issues that are important to them. But would you like to have a plebiscite, say not a referendum, a binding referendum, but a plebiscite which is not binding, or a simple poll, and say this is what the majority of people in Canada stand for, and this is what I represent, I represent them. You know what? That would be awesome. It would be awesome if you're going to have a vote on something like that, that you give people the information that they need to make an informed decision about that. And if it's not being talked about in the mainstream media, then and, and people aren't getting education about what investor state means in trade agreements, they can't make an informed decision yeah. on, on, in a poll, can they? Sure. of March, we expect the Conservatives will not entertain any amendments. That's normally what they do. They don't allow any amendments to the bill. It'll come back to the House for report stage and third reading. And if I were a betting woman, they're going to time allocate that as well and say you only get, you know, five or six or seven hours to debate this bill. It'll then come from a, for a vote. Conservatives have majority. It'll pass. And then it will go to the Senate. So, so what needs to happen is the Senate doesn't always necessarily toe the Conservative Party line. So if it passes in the House, you need to do a full court press on senators. So get ready, like we can't, we can't let this go. We, we need to stop it every way we can. And what, what's happened in the House of Commons is, is that the Conservatives have become very good at using the tools of the House of Commons to limit debate. And, and th there are very few mechanisms for us to stop them. So we need Canadians from coast to coast to coast to get on the Twitter and Facebook and contact your Conservative MPs to say, do not pass this bill. And then if it passes in the House, we need to get them onto the Senate. And so we really need to keep this fight on. So thank you very much for coming out and uh, supporting everybody who's fighting against this bill. All right, thank you, Jean. This is not the time for the politics of fear. This is the time when we need to be working together and we need to be looking at conservatives, progressive conservatives like our allies, and asking them to press their members of parliament, 
We need to educate people in the community about this. We need to do things about mental health and addiction, like proper services for people with mental health and addiction, because we know that the, the gunman in Ottawa had a mental health issue, and he had an addiction problem, and he was reaching out, and nothing came of it. This is a time when we need to reach out to our friends and neighbors in the Muslim and Islamic communities. Yeah. They need to know that we're with them. This is a time when we need to be working on education programs and, and making sure that we don't have self-radicalized youth. And there's a lot that we, can, that we can be doing to enfranchise our youth so they don't feel like they're going to just throw everything away and, and uh, get involved in some campaign that they know nothing about. You're doing a great uh, job here in educating people about Bill C-51. Wouldn't you like to see a plebiscite on it? Um, it would be interesting to see a plebiscite on it, but but again, like you, you have to have an educated voter mm. to have a plebiscite. And you don't and, think they're educated? Well, I yet. don't think. I think that uh, people are starting to understand what the process is because the media is talking more about what the problems are with Bill C fifty one. But until you get a balance in the media about about what the issues are, and until you can get beyond the media too, because lots of people don't pay attention to the news anymore. Um, you have to you have to have an informed and engaged yeah. public to have an informed engaged vote. So you think we should keep on educating people for of another course. few years before we have a referendum? Well, I think we should just keep uh, educating people as much as possible. Yeah. And and if and you know if referendums are in order, you need to have a, a, a kind of a fair and balanced playing field for mm -hmm. referendums so that organizations like the Council of Canadians aren't up against huge media conglomerates or the government to counter their message because you end up spending lots of time, money and energy on trying to encourage people to vote a certain way and you have to educate them about it. Do you Whereas think the government will just say, well, we need Bill C-51 because we got an Islamic terrorist, they're coming to this country, if we don't stop them, we're going to get overrun. And that's a simple, simple message and I think that, that the, the answer to that messaging is, is more complex and people yeah. need to understand it. I would accept referendums on, on any chunk of uh, important legislation mm. if there is a process that, that allows for real education of the electorate before you, you do that. Yeah. Anyway, I wish you well, Paul, and thank you very much for your time. Mr. British Columbia? Yes, I am. Did you order some democracy pizza? Yes, I did. Well, we've got three types here for you. All right. This one is called representative democracy. Oh, that's a first pass, first pass the poll. First, yeah, that's a, a normal kind think? of representation. What do you think? Yes, yes, it smells old. Old, old, okay. Well, let's try this one. This representative democracy, but it's proportional democracy. Now, yes, in 2005, 57% mm. of your neighbors wanted yeah. this kind of pizza. Well, that empowers the parties. I want to oh, empower myself, the individual. Well, and the radio said just a couple weeks ago, 67% of your neighbors mm. wanted this kind. It looks good to me. Yeah, yeah. Looks good. Well, it's, looks it's good. better than... Uh, we've got one more kind here. Now, this is very new. Very yes. tasty, I've heard. Now, this is called direct democracy pizza. I like that. In 1991, 83% of your neighbors yes. wanted this. Let's see. Yes. That smells good. Okay, well, mm. what kind would you like? You either proportional or direct democracy? I like direct democracy. Why All would right. I give my power to somebody else to represent me when I can represent myself? Mm, smells good. Okay, well, enjoy. Direct democracy. Thank enjoy you. your direct democracy. Mm, yummy.